Uh, welcome everyone to this panel of the Genomic Prediction webinar series. I'm Lauren Teller, the CEO. I will moderate this panel titled Rank Ordering Embryos for Transfer, Patient and Clinician Perspectives on PCP. PCP means testing the embryo for polygenic disorders. We'll explore the ethics of rank ordering embryos for polygenic disease risk. The question is, what is important? There will be five short presentations followed by a discussion panel. The five parts will be, will respectively address clinical perspectives, clinical utilization challenges, clinical utility validation, patient perspective, and ethicist perspective. Let me introduce each of the six panelists here. First, Professor Julian Savulescu, your hero chair in practical ethics at the University of Oxford, director of the Oxford Uhiro Center for Practical Ethics and co-director of the Wellcome Center for Ethics and Humanities. He is a former editor and current board member of the Journal of Medical Ethics, ranked as the number one bioethics journal in the world by Google Scholar Metrics in 2013. In addition to this background uh, in applied ethics and philosophy, he also has a background in medicine and neuroscience from Monash University. Second, Dr. Rafael Smigrodsky, the father of the first baby to be born in history after PCP, or pre implantation genetic testing for polygenic disorders. Dr. Smigrodsky is an MD, PhD with Shulia Biotech, with over 31 years of active medical doctor experience, combining the perspective of medical professional and researcher, and that of a parent to this panel. Third, famous in the world of IVF since her conception. Elizabeth Carr was, at the time of her birth, called the first test tube baby in the USA and the 14th in the world at a time when IVF was still extremely controversial. Elizabeth's career in journalism naturally drew her to interview and gather perspectives of early IVF children, lending perspective deeply valuable to today's subject. Fourth, Dr. Nathan Trepp is founder and chief science officer of Genome Prediction and the technical architect of the PCP test, which Rafal used. He's an associate professor at Rutgers University School of Medicine, where he teaches reproductive genetics. Dr. Trepp has published over 100 peer-reviewed papers in this subject and serves as a member of the ASRM Research Committee, a senior associate editor of JARG, and as editor of Fertility and Sterility. Fifth, Jennifer Eccles is head of genetic counseling at Genome Prediction and the author of written content in the PCP uh, test, which Paul used. She's a 20 year expert in reproductive clinical genetics, a licensed and certified genetic counselor, and has devoted a career to genetic testing of IVF couples at various stages along the path to parenthood. Finally, our first speaker, Professor Simon Fischel, early IVF pioneer, worked 10 years with the Nobel laureate inventor of IVF, Professor Sir Robert Edwards, from 1975 to 1985, and was part of the original team of four to open the world's first IVF unit, Bourne Hall, outside Cambridge in 1980. We estimate that he has been the responsible IVF physician for about 10,000 babies over 40 years. He's today the head of Genome Prediction's Scientific Advisory Board and the first speaker today. Uh, Simon, the floor is yours. Okay, so. Um, so we're talking about right ordering embryos for implantation, as Laurent said. Thank you, Laurent, for the introduction. So IVF uh, has never been a, a stranger to um, any form of controversy and disapproval, even from the first baby and beforehand. Uh, we know, for example, in those very early days, um, when the US Congress hearing in 1974, Nobel laureate James Watson used demonizing terminology for IVF and that it should never really be introduced, although, of course, there were people who were trying to, to make it work in, in those days. And then the first baby was born in 1978, and there was continual controversy and concern over every aspect of IVF and its progress. Uh, even uh, eminent individuals in the UK, for example, once IVF babies were born, calling it a contract. Uh, no self-respecting doctor should be involved, it's unethical. 
we had articles, as you can see here, uh, even depicted in, in the Times, where test tube babies were actually babies in test tubes that were being prodded and poked, etc. Cryopreservation was demeaned. The development of sperm injection. I remember when I was doing that, um, it's almost unconscionable to think of it now, but we had patients who eventually developed, uh, had babies, who were told that they shouldn't come to our clinic because it was a male factor problem and that would never be resolved by IVF and certainly sperm injection was not a technology that should be used and it's unproven, etc. When cell biopsy was developed, then of course the development of uh, monogenic screening, EGTM, this was uh, deemed to be, uh, it had pejorative connotations with it and design of babies. And in fact, when the first tissue typing work was done and uh, we planned to do this in the UK, it was considered so unethical that it had to go all the way to the House of Lords for decision to be taken, to be able to screen embryos on that basis. So the history is there of difficulties with any new development in the the other point that's also very important is whether we, as practitioners, have a duty to inform. We inform patients about themselves and their embryos because we know now that there's a lot of data out there suggesting for some reason that infertility patients themselves, when compared to the general population, are at elevated risk of other diseases that we would not associate with infertility, certain cancers, for example metabolic disorders. Um, we can see here a list of publications that uh, discuss the data. We know also, for example, male factor infertility have problems associated um, with unexpected increases in colon and uterine cancers. And as I say here, that it, uh, the effects of infertility may extend beyond gynecological cancers, such as thyroid cancers and melanomas, which deserve specific attention and particularly with respect to endometriosis. So uh, there's a conclusion here from the paper in 2019. The results suggest that among US women, the experience of infertility at any point in a woman's reproductive window may be associated with late life cardiovascular health. And health is extremely important to us. And therefore, there must be a duty to inform patients of their own risks and then potentially the risks to embryos. Selecting and ranking them has always had an imperative in IVF from the very beginning, except at the very, very beginning in terms of the birth of the first IVF baby with Louise Brown, where an eight cell was transferred, there was only one embryo. So there wasn't selection. But once, as we see here, the other pioneers in different parts of the world, in Australia, in India, and of course, especially in the United States and in Paris, Stimulated cycles were used, and right up to the present day, we know that it is more successful to use stimulated cycles, and therefore multiple embryos were chosen. Now, ironically, in those early days, multiple embryos were transferred, which today we know is, is poor practice because of the risk of multiple pregnancy. And we can achieve today with a single embryo much higher live birth rates than we did in those early days with multiple embryo transfers. So we've achieved a great deal to transfer a single embryo and to select the single embryo, but we have to select the single embryo. And we can see here, for example, we have always been concerned to do this in some form or other. Uh, one of our papers in 1981, the American Journal of Obstetrics and Gynecology, uh, was looking at growth rates. These are from old slides for those of you who you remember the days when we had slides. Um, these are, these are uh, old slides showing where we try to assess embryonic um, viability by looking at these uh, growth rates. Because we knew, and it's clear still today, that probably only 30, 40% of conceptions result in a live birth. And that is not just necessarily related to IVF. So there is a clinical imperative and this was known since 1984, really, and the work between 84 and 86 by uh, Rosalind Angel and their colleagues in Edinburgh, when they looked at chromosome studies on human fertilized eggs and realized that those embryos had a high incidence of chromosomal anomalies. 
which we know also occurs after in vivo conception. And so again, there was a clinical imperative, which took many years before we could get to the point of, of scoring embryos on the basis of the chromosomes, but the imperative was there for us to do so. And now today, we have a, a whole range of technologies trying to rank order so selection is there, but this is the first time we are considering selection on the basis of health, which to me is, is utterly um, critical and an imperative in itself. Thank you. Can you see my screen? Perfect, thank you. Okay, great. So I'm going to focus on uh, the current use of PGTP and what it looks like now in the clinical setting. And so here's a sample report from a PGTP result. And PGTP stands for pre-implantation genetic testing for polygenic conditions. And polygenic conditions are conditions that are influenced by genetic changes um, in multiple genes, hence the poly in polygenic. And these are conditions that we're very familiar with uh, that are extremely common, uh, like diabetes and certain cancers, uh, cardiac issues, schizophrenia. And what we can do is we can use this data to determine what the risk is for an, em for an embryo to develop uh, these conditions over the course of uh, their lifetime. And this information can be used then to decide and triage uh, which embryo to transfer first. And so when a couple elects PGTP testing, they have the opportunity to get a whole list of uh, risks, uh, absolute risks for a bunch of different conditions. These risks are compared to the average risk, so they can tell where this risk falls, if it's higher than what we would expect in the general population or if it's lower. Um, further, couples can uh, decide if they have a particular family history or a particular concern about a condition. For example, we have a number of couples who come to us because they already have a child with type 1 diabetes and they're especially concerned about that condition. They can focus solely on getting information about just that condition or they can have uh, the opportunity to get a uh, more global score. Uh, the most important piece of information on the report is uh, the number in the middle of that circle is the embryo health score. And the embryo health score is essentially an amalgamation of all of the different polygenic risk scores combined together so that uh, physicians and couples can get a, a global health score. Um, and be able to use one specific number to make the decision about which embryo to transfer uh, easier. So for example, um, like Professor Fischel said, uh, in the past, prior to PGTP testing, um, we had different ways of selecting which embryo to transfer first, whether that be um, based on morphology or based on aneuploidy. Um, but if a couple is lucky enough to have uh, euploid embryos to transfer, and especially multiple euploid embryos to transfer, we can add this embryo health score into the mix and this number can be used to make it uh, uh, give another way of uh, deciding very simply which embryo has less chance of those uh, health risks. And so in this example, it's easy to see that embryo four um, would be the embryo that should be chosen to transfer. The way that I know that is because the average embryo health score is zero. Anything above zero has better than average uh, risk scores for those conditions. Anything below zero um, has uh, worse than average or poor than average uh, risk scores. So who may consider PGTP testing? Um, certainly patients who are already undergoing PGTA, for example, uh, may consider this testing. We all have risks for these types of conditions. It's global. Um, and we're able to do this testing on the same sample we would be um, using for PGTA testing. Um, this test really shines when we have multiple embryos to compare with other embryos in the cohort of samples that that couple makes. So patients expected to have many euploid embryos 
uh, may especially benefit from this testing. And certainly couples who have a known family history of polygenic conditions, like the example I gave before with type 1 diabetes, um, or any other conditions where they're more concerned about their starting risk because they already have a family history of these conditions. With that said, there are definitely limitations to this testing and important considerations when we're thinking about the best use of this type of technology. And so polygenic risk scores are, were primarily derived and tested in individuals with European ancestry. Um, the predictive power is reduced in individuals from other ethnic groups. Um, and right now, clinically, we're offering this testing primarily in individuals who have Caucasian and Asian ancestry. And we hope that will change uh, very quickly. But in the meantime, um, this is an important uh, you know, piece of the puzzle and important to discuss with patients, particularly patients from other ethnic groups besides European ancestry. Um, certainly, there are financial issues as well. This adds cost to a, a process that's already expensive, and adding this additional testing and these additional costs do have the potential to widen the divide between um, individuals who have the means to get this testing versus people who don't have the means to get this testing or undergo IVF in general. And there are a bunch of counseling issues that we definitely need to think about. You know, IVF is, is already a process that can be bumpy for many couples. Um, and although the goal of this testing is not to increase anxiety, it certainly has the potential to increase anxiety. Uh, couples may uh, get information that they're not expecting about their embryos, which can be very anxiety provoking. Uh, there's extra time needed to discuss and review all of these issues uh, that may come up. And there is definitely the potential for there to be an overwhelming amount of information um, for some couples um, that may uh, prevent them from easier decision making, which is really the goal of this test is to help make it uh, make a simpler decision about which embryo to select for transfer. One of the concerns um, that uh, clinicians may have is the whole idea that this uh, falls under the category of risk reduction versus diagnostic testing. Uh, what we're so used to in, in IVF when it comes to PGT testing, particularly PGTM or monogenic or single gene testing, is the idea that uh, this monogenic testing is going to give you a yes or no answer. Yes, there's a, a the, an embryo is expected to have this condition or not have this condition, and it's very black and white. And this whole idea that these are not black and white um, pieces of information, that it is a risk reduction, can be very daunting. But I would say actually that we are, have already delved into risk reduction. And PGTM is commonly used for risk reduction, even now, uh, routinely. And one example that I always think of is uh, PGTM for cystic fibrosis, which was one of the very first uses of PGTM um, and one of the very first cases. And um, uh, back in the 90s, PGTM for cystic fibrosis uh, was for a couple who had Delta F508 variants, which are severe variants associated with classic cystic fibrosis, severe lung issues and pancreatic insufficiency, shortened lifespan. Um, and now this type of testing is, is really not questioned at all. Um, but with the advent of expanded carrier screening, next generation sequencing, whole exome sequencing, it's not infrequent at all. In fact, it's common for us, and we get requests all the time to address PGTM for cystic fibrosis for mild variants, variants that when they're combined together may be associated with a risk for pancreatic insufficiency or a risk for male factor infertility or maybe embryos may be asymptomatic, even if they have a combination of those variants. So I would say we're already in that space with the idea of, of testing for conditions that have a lower um, a disease burden and conditions that may not occur until um, adult onset, conditions of lesser severity, conditions that have reduced penetrance. And the ASRM has already spoken about that back in 2018, saying that's something that's ethically allowable. I think the most important, and I'm biased because I am a genetic counselor, but I think the most important piece of the puzzle when we're talking about polygenic testing is the need for uh, informed consent, detailed genetic counseling, and discussing the benefits and limitations of this testing um, with families. That That is the case for PGT in general, particular, 
particularly PGTP. Um, and by um, having those detailed conversations with couples, this really allows couples to gather as much information as possible to make the decision that's right for them when it comes to this type of test testing. Thank you, that's it. Okay, yeah, I'll, I'll be maybe uh, a little uh, quicker. And uh, my task was to really talk about um, the validation of the testing that we're doing. And initially, this was a big question. People were wondering, well, how are you going to know it works? You're going to have to wait for years before these embryos uh, become adults. Um, and so it's a concept that we've had to address. Uh, demonstrating clinical utility is uh, obviously an important part of having a clinical genetic test available to patients. Um, and, and fortunately, now it's become less of a focus uh, as people recognize the work we've done. It has become more of a question around ethics, which is, I think, part of why we're having this uh, discussion. We've published quite a few papers, but I'm just going to talk uh, briefly about uh, one recent paper where uh, we looked at performance of uh, genetic selection among over 11,000 sibling pairs uh, to really model the situation where you have two chromosomally normal embryos available for transfer. The first part of that is to demonstrate that the data we obtain from an embryo is equivalent in accuracy to the data that you can obtain from adults. Um, and so really all we're basing the diagnosis on is the information we obtained from the DNA. And so now what we can do is evaluate performance in adult sibling pairs where we know their disease status. So again, we don't have to wait uh, for embryos to turn into adults. In this example, uh, what we have is a prevalence of 11% of the disease um, in this population, again, of sibling pairs. So if you were to randomly choose one, uh, the prevalence would remain the same. In contrast, if you genetically select one of the two siblings, uh, you can achieve what we call a relative risk reduction. In this example, going from 11 to 3% uh, reduces the risk by 73% uh, compared to random selection. And actual performance we published in the journal Genes on several common diseases listed here, all of which were reduced in parallel, which really suggests positive pleiotropy. Uh, so what we've shown here is relative risk reduction, significant relative risk reduction with genetic selection versus random selection. And I think um, one of the interesting things about random selection is in, in the situation we have now, we're basing uh, the decision on morphology, which actually might be worse than random based on the quiet embryo hypothesis. We tend to choose embryos that are developing faster, and those might actually have reduced long-term health outcomes. Um, so uh, I wanted to just show one example. Uh, and I think it's one of the advantages we have with the testing we're doing that patients can actually perform conventional PGTA first. And that was the situation here. We learned that the partner had type 1 diabetes. And so all they had to do was to, to provide uh, saliva. We analyzed parental DNA. And then we could add embryo health scores, which can be used uh, to rank embryos for transfer. In this situation, they had six embryos to begin with. One was aneuploid, they had five remaining, and we have a large data set on families with larger number of siblings with known type, type 1 diabetes status. Uh, and here with five to choose from, there's a 72% risk reduction. But again, even with only two, it's still a significant uh, benefit to using genetic testing versus random. And that is it from me. Thank you. Okay, so uh, I'm the father of Aurea, who is the first uh, PGTP baby ever born. And um, I first read about uh, the use of polygenic scores uh, for human embryos and about the company genomic prediction uh, in an article in the MIT Review of uh, Technology in November of 2017. I'm a physician, I'm a neurologist, but I always had an interest in genetics. My, my MD-PhD work was on the genetics of EEG variants. Uh, so I was quite, uh, quite intrigued by this uh, report. Uh, it's an amazing technology where uh, you can actually do genetic sequencing on these very tiny embryos. Uh, and it was especially interesting because at that time, 
uh, me and my girlfriend were already thinking about uh, having a baby. Uh, so fast forward to, to 2019, we finally decided to, uh, to have a baby. Uh, we found an IVF provider in, Char in Charlotte. Uh, and uh, then I contacted Genomic Prediction to uh, do PGTP on our embryos. And at first, uh, everything looked promising. We we're working with that provider. But uh, at some point, uh, that provider told us uh, that it would be unethical uh, to use PGDP. Uh, and she did not elaborate on exactly why. Uh, I was quite unhappy about it, but uh, since I'm uh, kind of a persistent guy, I uh, started looking again for other providers, finally were able to find a provider in Washington, D.C. And uh, we had a very good experience um, and um, were able to generate 16 embryos six of which were tested with PGDP. Uh, so I was quite excited to finally uh, get uh, a report. And that's the report, uh, parts of the report that we received. Just a second. So uh, here I'm showing you a comparison between two female embryos. Uh, we're leaning towards uh, having another girl. Uh, but uh, we're not quite sure uh, if the genomic uh, testing would favor a boy, then we'd be going on with a boy. Uh, so uh, we had two female embryos and two uh, male embryos. And at that time, with the initial version of, of the uh, report, the uh, what we got was basically risk percentiles for various conditions and the ratios to uh, average risk. And that is uh, maybe a little bit confusing because uh, it's hard to tell uh, which one of these numbers is most important. Now, from my general knowledge of medicine, of course, I know that heart attack, uh, coronary artery disease, and in general, cardiovascular risk factors are the most important. Uh, so I chose to concentrate on uh, these specific numbers. So if you look here, uh, embryo number one uh, is in the 47th percentile of uh, risk for heart attack, but embryo number 12 is in the 92nd percentile. And there is, uh, there is a similar situation with uh, most of the other risk factors for cardiovascular disease. Uh, so in this case, it was actually pretty easy to decide that embryo number one uh, should be the favored one. Uh, the male embryos were better than uh, embryo number 12, but they were not any better than embryo number one. So we decided to go uh, with embryo number one. And we were quite lucky uh, because soon, uh, well, actually, nine months later, uh, we had Aurea, uh, the first uh, PGTB baby. We're lucky on first attempt, uh, it was a successful pregnancy. Uh, Aria is doing very well. Uh, and um, uh, she's developing uh, great. Uh, but uh, since then, uh, genomic prediction has done a lot of progress. So as Nathan was mentioning, um, there, are, there is some progress in validating uh, the scores. So this is an illustration of the score being applied, applied to our embryos. Here we have distribution of possible uh, embryonic health scores in the general population. Uh, here is myself, here's the donor. Uh, here's the distribution of likely health scores uh, for embryos generated uh, between me and the, and the donor. And as you can see, uh, our embryos uh, had a nice spread from very nice uh, to not so good. And uh, I was very happy to see uh, that the embryo that I selected uh, two years prior uh, actually turns out to have the best embryonic health score. Uh, but then also there is the sobering thought that uh, the other embryo, embryo number uh, 12, that was under consideration, uh, has a dramatically lower score. Uh, so it means that uh, if 
uh, PGTP was not available and we're choosing randomly, uh, then uh, baby Aurea would have been born uh, from an embryo with a much higher risk of cardiovascular disease and other conditions. Uh, so I'm quite glad that uh, this didn't happen. So this is the story of Aurea, uh, but um, let me share some of my thoughts and reflections on uh, on the uh, issue of uh, babies and genetic testing. First of all, I think that uh, PGTP uh, is a truly revolutionary technology. As Nathan mentioned, uh, PGTP, if applied to uh, the population at large, could reduce uh, the incidence of diverse conditions by as much as 50%. And this is huge. This is uh, this is bigger than antibiotics. Antibiotics is something that we use to treat people who show up in the hospital, uh, but uh, PGTP actually allows us to avoid disease in the first place. And that, and in this way, it is similar to sanitation and vaccines. So I think that uh, PGTP has the potential uh, to be more, uh, have a bigger impact on, uh, on human health uh, than vaccines and sanitation. And there is more. Uh, consistently applying that technology over generations would uh, allow for compounding of benefits. Uh, so uh, yes, that would also reduce the quote unquote diversity uh, of genomes. Uh, but here we're talking about eliminating uh, the diversity where some people get sick. And that's not the kind of diversity we want to maintain. Uh, and another uh, thought is that uh, PGTP uh, directly looks at genes which are the causes of disease rather than looking at any proxies. So it means that we're much less likely to uh, encounter um, un unforeseen uh, problems, although of course the possibility of uh, pleiotropy exists. Now, the second thing that I uh, that I need to mention is that, as I said, I was quite baffled and angry when the IVF provider uh, told me that uh, it would be unethical to uh, give good genes to my daughter. Uh, I think that I was uh, completely wrong. I think that uh, me as a parent, uh, I have a duty uh, to take care of my children, and that involves uh, taking care of their health. and. Um, a healthy body requires healthy genes. It's my duty as a parent uh, to give uh, the best genes to my daughter that I can afford. And that's exactly what I did. Uh, I think that um, PGDP um, most likely will make a big difference uh, in, in her life. Um, and uh, to summarize, I'm quite happy that I was able to use PGDP uh, so early, as soon as it became available. Uh, I didn't know uh, Aurea would be the first baby ever, but it's always good to know that uh, I'm on the cutting edge. Uh, and I'm happy that uh, Aurea was able to benefit from this amazing technology. And I also hope that uh, in the future, PGTP will be available widely, uh, could maybe even become uh, the default uh, method of making babies and that future generations will be uh, grateful uh, to us for making that choice. And that's all I have to say. Thanks, Rafal. It's always so fun to hear you talk um, and hear you talk about the first uh, in the world uh, as a first myself. So I wanted to focus on the fact that um, when it comes to the ethics, my experience, obviously, as a first IVF baby in the US, is that the ethics played out in real life. So I just want to take a little trip back in history to kind of mirror what Simon kind of set the scene for. When I was born, um, there was kind of an inherent duty to inform from my parents' OBGYN. He had told my parents that they would not have a child naturally, that perhaps they should think of adoption. And one of the last conversations that he had with my mother was <clears throat> throwing a brochure across the uh, 
you know, office table at my parents and saying, I don't know, I, I went to this conference, I learned about this thing called IVF. Um, it's very controversial, but maybe you want to uh, look, at, look into it. And that was the extent of the conversation. And so then my parents took it upon themselves to do uh, as much as much research as they could at the time, which was very little, and uh, investigate what IVF was. And so they applied to the program that the Jones were building down in Norfolk, Virginia. And as basically as soon as my parents applied, the Jones called and said, when can you get here? Uh, my mother was otherwise healthy and had uh, you know, infertility issues based on scar tissue from a botched surgery when she was younger. So she was a good candidate. Um, and, you know, in, in listening to Rafal's story, there are so many parallels that still keep repeating themselves. And I think people that have been around the IVF industry or in the assistive reproductive world for a while kind of recognize these arguments and patterns. And what's very interesting is when, you know, he experienced the clinic saying, you know, we can't do this, uh, it's unethical. My parents actually had to have me in Virginia because when I was born, IVF was actually illegal and banned in Massachusetts where I live and where my parents lived. And so my parents were actually traveling back and forth to Virginia to undergo these treatments because, um, you know, it, it wasn't available here. And, you know, to, to me, uh, that just kind of illustrates that some of the same arguments are around still that were around when I was born. And it really only became um, acceptable and commonplace as more and more people accessed it. And so um, on the flip side of the irony coin is the fact that Massachusetts then went on to become one of the first uh, states in the nation to mandate insurance coverage for IVF. And so they have one of the best policies in the country that makes it, you know, much easier for people to access. Um, and so that just kind of shows you the span of in, you know, 39 years, how far um, one set of society can come. Um, the other thing to think about here is, you know, the ethics surrounding um, when Nathan was talking about uh, validating this. Um, you know, it's interesting to think back that my uh, one single embryo, my parents didn't have more that were retrieved. I was it. There was no choice. There was no option. Um, and they had to just look at it under a microscope. There weren't great um, best practices for embryo selection back then. They were still kind of tweaking and figuring out um, how to go about the embryo selection and um, you know, I was, I was it as my mother likes to say. Uh, and so to then go back and look at that, uh, also shows just the ability of choice that patients have now that so many people back when I was born didn't have. And my mother always says, you know, it was a little bit of a blessing in disguise that there was so little information about this technology. And there were so many things that they didn't know. Um, my parents were a, a part of a cohort of 10 where the doctors were just trying different protocols on every set of patients. And so no patient really knew who was going to hit the lottery, so to speak. Um, and so like for fall, my parents didn't know until they had a, um, you know, a pregnancy that they were going to be the first in the U.S. And uh, so that kind of took them by surprise as well. And so all of these things, it's kind of interesting as an outsider and an insider, you know, I've sat in, in so many reproductive conferences over the years, and it's always struck me how interesting it is that um, the technology and the ethics discussions are really operated on a spectrum. And, you know, I think to me, it all comes down to access and education. You know, if more people understand what options they have available to them, to them, the better educated they're going to be to make the decision that's right for them. And, you know, back when I was born, there were really two options. My parents could try IVF and try for a child of their own, um, or they could adopt. And so they picked the best option for them at the time. And I think, you know, that's kind of where we've always operated from is 
um, the reason my parents decided to go public and not stay quiet about this was because they felt very strongly that everybody should know about the options available out there. Um, and so, you know, it's similar to the duty to inform uh, discussion we were talking about with, with medical providers. So um, that's just a little bit of my perspective. Um, and I thank you all for sharing with me today. Um, so I, I would like to start by saying uh, I'm a, a believer in principle uh, of this technology and um, uh, I uh, take a completely opposite view to the clinic that um, Raphael encountered uh, and, and think there's actually a, a moral obligation to use tests which reduce the risks of um, disease in, in embryos. Um, so, in, in 2001, I articulated this principle called procreative beneficence, which, which in essence says there's a moral obligation uh, of couples to select the embryo with the best chance of the best life, and that, and that includes the lowest chance of disease. Um, and this has proved to be my most provocative article. There, there are 800 or so articles responding to it. But actually, it just expresses a, uh, a common sense principle. Um, so to, to see how people are committed to, to a moral obligation to reduce uh, incidence of disease, we only have to think back to the Zika epidemic, when Public Health England and the CDC both recommended that people returning from Zika-infected areas such as Brazil wait three months before attempting to conceive a child. Now the child that they will conceive in three months is different to the child that they would conceive now. It would be a different sperm and a different egg. So what Public Health England and the CDC are essentially saying is, if you have two embryos, um, one of which is going to have a risk of microcephaly and intellectual disability, and one which doesn't have those risks, you should, you, sh you ought to select the embryo which doesn't have the risk of intellectual disability. And this is just procreative beneficence. Uh, and as I think um, uh, uh, um, the, the sort of the second speaker said, we already accept um, other uh, screening tests to reduce the incidence of disease. Now, so I think that there is a strong reason to, to employ this technology. Before I, I sort of go on, I want to just though express a, a couple of um, slight reservations or qualifications with what's been said before. The first one is um, the use of this overall um, embryonic health score. Um, so I'd, I'd like to know how that's derived, uh, but I'm almost certain it will involve certain value judgments about different conditions. And, and I think that risks being quite paternalistic and also run, uh, run, run awry in terms of, of, of ethics. And, and the reason for that is exactly as Raphael said, when you look down the, the kinds of conditions that risk profiles are provided for, he focused on, on cardiovascular disease, a very reasonable um, way to go because that's a very common disease. But if you if you go back to Jennifer um, when she showed um, the risk profile, um, one of the embryos had a, had a high risk of schizophrenia. <laughs> now schizophrenia is vastly worse than hypertension or basal cell carcinoma. Um, so I think there are going to be very interesting value judgments in 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 actually deciding which is the best embryo. Uh, and we can have a have a discussion about how how ethics might have an input into that. But at very least, uh, I think uh, uh, couples need to see the whole profile rather than just this overall score, which risks what I've called kind of um, elsewhere something like decimal point mystification. If if you want to sort of give people the air of extraordinary scientific accuracy, you add several decimal points. And I was pleased to see there was only one decimal point on the um, on the overall health score, but I, I suspect this overall health score is 
really a set of values that the people that derived it have rather than what patients have or or indeed what might be most ethically justifiable as i said i think mental health conditions are going to be amongst the worst uh, conditions that would would affect an embryo so that's one thing the second thing is that that um that Raphael said that this is going to revolutionise medicine on a level with antibiotics and other major advances. I think it is going to, to make a big difference and I think it is the future and, and I want to be involved in thinking about the ethics of it. Um, I don't think it's going to revolutionise medicine uh, and the reason for that is you, you can only produce 10 or 20 embryos so your chance of producing the very best embryo that a couple could produce is is, is almost zero. Um, you would need hundreds of thousands of embryos to select against a large numbers of genes. Uh, so until we have something like pluripotent stem cell derived gametes and embryos uh, and huge numbers produced, the, the, the opportunity for having a, a, a radical increase uh, in, in the lives of the next generation is limited. Uh, and what will really revolutionise medicine is gene editing, because there you can um, you can change hundreds of genes and not just select from from ten or twenty embryos. So I think that is one reason to be um, a little bit cautious at this point about the the level of impact. The second one is he mentioned again the issue of pleiotropy. So and we didn't discuss that in great detail, but you might choose the embryo with the lowest risk of, of, of heart disease, um, but that embryo might have the, the, the lowest chance of, of significantly um, improved cognitive ability. Um, so until we fully understand the package that we're picking, um, we are still guessing, and, and, I, and I'm all in favour of, of, of guessing on the basis of the information that we have, but I don't, you know, that even that poor embryo, which was down at the bottom in terms of risk factors on the overall health score, um, might have had other traits which, which um, are more than going to outbalance the disadvantage in terms of health. So, I mean, that's something that just needs more research. Um, but I think that that kind of qualification is sort of necessary at this point. Um, so those are sort of just two slight reservations, but um, as the principle of procreate beneficence says, you should use polygenic scores to attempt to choose the, the embryo with the best chance of the best life of the embryos which you have available. So, you know, we've outlined a number of differences between polygenic scores and traditional estimates of risk, um, so I won't rehearse these. Um, the, key, the key issue for for many jurisdictions outside of the United States, such as the UK, Australia, um, and Simon, correct me if I'm wrong, but in most of these jurisdictions, there are significant restrictions on what you can test embryos for. And typically, you can only test for significant risks of major diseases. Um, these jurisdictions have even struggled you know, with conditions of like late onset cancer. Um, BRCA genes. So they, I don't believe, will be able to accommodate polygenic scores. Um, so there is the risk that the traditional disease model will not allow um, you to, to use polygenic scores. So that's going to require um, some degree of, of revision. Um, in the US, you have a libertarian model, um, but that has a number of, of um, shortcomings, I think, uh, as or has already been described, it, it's, it's going to be only available to the wealthy. Companies will, with their financial interests, will make decisions. Um, there are there are problems with with little social input or uh, control over what is tested for and what's not not tested for. And so, in this paper, we argue on the basis of procreative beneficence for a new welfareist model that. Uh, allows for selection for any trait which is associated uh, with, with changes in prospective well-being, either being increased or decreased, which is broader than, than health or disease. And this obviously requires uh, a, a discussion of, of what well-being is, but you know, that problem also besets the disease model because, and the current way that you're using polygenic scores, because as I said, you have to rank diseases. 
And Raphael made a very reasonable judgment that, that heart disease is very common, but you might think that schizophrenia is worse than heart disease. Um, and that and basal cell carcinoma, typically treatable. Uh, hypertension, typically treatable. So I think there's gonna be an interesting, whether you adopt the full welfare model or even a, a modified disease uh, model, you're going to have to come to some uh, uh, more ethically informed way of, of evaluating different conditions. And you know, what we proposed in the paper was a, was a threshold model uh, uh, of, of, a, of an impact on wellbeing, and this would apply to continuous traits, uh, a, a, not just diseases. So we argued in favour of a supportive infrastructure. I think that this will have a profound uh, impact um, to a degree on, on the next generation, and so it should be available to everyone, just as uh, you know, basic disease prevention should be available. So this is not something that, that should only be uh, available to the rich. Um, and I think, although it's not cost effective at the moment, um, in terms of couples already having IVF, there are gonna be little extra costs to, to introducing polygenic scores. So um, given that you have to select one of your 20 embryos, um, there, there is a strong reason to use whatever information you have, even if weakly probabilistic, to attempt to, to select the embryo with the lowest chance of disease or the best chance of the best life. Um, there are a number of objections to the welfareist model. Um, and I, I think the strongest one is currently the, the, the questions around reliability of polygenic scores and also pleiotropy. Um, but of course, there is the familiar concern around eugenics. But of course, this applies uh, to, to current monogenic testing. Uh, as in the same way as it, it applies to polygenic testing. Uh, and in general, the, the, the way to avoid objectionable eugenics, the sort of Nazi style eugenics, is to allow couples to make their own choice, to, to have good um, scientific inf information, not to be a, trying to achieve some racist social Darwin state vision of a, of a population, but aiming at the well being of the child, and in this case, being free of disease. Um, there is a chance that. Parents will, if they know their embryo is at a higher risk of a condition, uh, be concerned about that condition uh, and, and hyper-parenting as Michael Sandel occurs. Um, but that's really a problem with parenting that needs to be addressed separately. Um, and of course, people will, will always have um, reactions to di different characteristics of the child. Um, as was already said, this is based on a Caucasian sample. So one of the concerns is it will entrench injustice, particularly racial injustice. Um, but uh, you know, that really is a, an issue for, for scientific design. And of course, there are familiar expressivist concerns. So I think we can develop models which, which will enable us to use this technology in an ethical way. Um, I believe we, we should move from a disease-based model to a broader welfare-based model um, and, and that, this, that this technology should be available um, to everyone. Uh, and the, the future of reproduction you know, may well be um, in the future artificial as these kinds of predictive uh, tools develop in power and particularly as, as, as gene editing becomes a, a possibility of of changing multiple numbers of genes. And I think the challenge is really going to be understanding pleiotropy, uh, but thank you. Unsurprisingly, very interesting, Julian. So um, what we've set up in the agenda is after everybody has spoken, um, we now have uh, some time for a panel where everybody can um, submit questions that, uh, you know, uh, we already have some questions that we've gone over in advance. Um, and one of the questions which we've gone over in advance is actually one of the last things that you touched upon, Julian, which was the potential for damaging relationships with, uh, between parents and children. Um, and that was one of the questions which uh, I'd like to ask of Elizabeth, because this is something that you described how as a, one of the first IVF children in the world, you felt that there were some expectations that were placed on you. Can I ask you to talk about that a bit? Sure. So obviously I wasn't selected as, as an embryo uh, over my 
from my parents. I was essentially the only embryo available. Um, but when I was born, uh, almost from the get-go, as young as I can remember, um, I just remember, you know, immense uh, pressure that I was a spokesperson. I was a spokesbaby. And that if I had not come out with 10 fingers and toes and doing all the right things on the right cue, um, it was very, um, I was very aware of the fact that, you know, IVF and or assistive reproductive technologies <clears throat> in the U.S. may be pushed back. Um, and I think that was why, you know, I was hauled out every milestone birthday or every time um, there was a new advance in the technology, they would say, let's talk to Elizabeth, um, you know, 10 years later, oh, look, she's still normal, you know, those kinds of things. And it wasn't a pressure that my parents put on me, but it was just something that I was inherently aware of. Um, you know, they always stressed to me that I was special because I was their child. Um, but, you know, when you go on a NOVA documentary and that's how you learn about your own birth, right, is from, from, from the moment you are uh, filmed at birth and then your two doctors sit side by side to you, um, even a, at a very young age, it was very hard for me not to understand the magnitude of what I was watching, right, of, of this is really a history-breaking moment. Um, and so there was always that thought in the back of my head that, you know, I had to say and do the right thing. Um, and I think it was probably a huge letdown to the world that I didn't go into math or science and I became a journalist, uh, you know, because I was born into this science and math world and I kind of, you know, that's not my thing. My thing is words. Um, so there was that pressure and I think that it's not given enough weight and I don't think that people, you know, when you talk with couples, they are so focused on the outcome of a child that they don't think beyond that. That's like, that's the end point instead of the starting point. Um, and so many couples as I've gotten older have asked my advice on how to tell their own children how they were born. Um, and with me, you know, I always have a little bit of a hard time uh, answering that question because I feel like I've always known. I mean, my first press conference was at three days old. So I, yes, I was told, but it was just normal to me. Um, but these couples that, you know, wait to explain how their ch children were born or anything like that, you know, it's a very hard conversation and everybody has to approach it differently. Um, and you know, some people have those conversations and some people don't. And so you can argue like, well, should the child, you know, is there a right to know on the child's part that they were brought into this world via, you know, um, IVF or some other technology? Um, so there's a lot of those questions that I think, um, you know, as a, as a group, we haven't really done a great job of helping people with resources on that, on that front. And I think you're going to have some of those same kind of questions, um, you know, uh, and, and I was studied many years after I was born to make sure I was quote unquote normal. I still remember those. Um, and I, I remember being offended um, that I was in this study, uh, I think when I was 20, stating, you know, this is a really well-adjusted and well-rounded population of, of kids. And I kept thinking like, yeah, but the elephant in the room is that all of our parents had the uh, financial and, you know, economic ability to go through this process. And so, of course, we're well-rounded. You know, it kind of was like uh, one of those moments where it was like the journalist and me just got really, really upset <laughs> that that wasn't called out. Um, it wasn't drawn attention to. So I think there are going to be some of those kind of messy things um, moving ahead that people really have to work to address. Could be that your cohort was genetically fortunate as well. Can I ask Rival, um, are you concerned about this with Oria? I mean, no, no, I, I, I'm not concerned. I mean, of course, I will tell. Uh, Aurea that mommy and daddy needed some help uh, but uh, I think that although PGDP is a major technological advance I think it's overall less less of a break from the past uh, 
right? Because IVF already exists. So we're that that was the big uh, shock, right? To some people, that was the big ethical controversy. And now we have uh, an improvement of an already existing technology. So I think that by the time uh, our is five years old, uh, PGTP will be well accepted, will be standard of care, and uh, it will be a non-issue. So I don't think that that uh, I need to worry about uh, Aurea being uh, in in some way singled out. And um, I think she will not uh, follow the same experience that uh, that Elizabeth had. I think that uh, it will be much more of a low key, low key situation. Yeah, but um, there is one remark that I that I uh, would want to make about uh, Professor Savulescu's uh, words. So, um, in your article, you're mentioning the scalar model uh, of of the um, approach to testing and uh, and selection, and that's that's what I would be arguing in favor of because. I feel that uh, any improvement um, in well-being, um, regardless of any thresholds, is valuable, right? It's, uh, yeah, it's, I, I it's... completely agree with you. Actually, I agree with you. I mean, you know, philosophically, yeah. I agree with you. Politically, okay. yeah. it's not. I think it's a long way from happening. I want yeah. to see a lot. <laughs> Although here in the United States, it it you know if if there is no heavy-handed regulation, uh, we will be going beyond beyond the threshold because right now Aurea already is uh, her uh, health score is above zero. It's one point three, uh, so we're already giving her a better health than than average, and um, uh, so the health score is actually built using. Uh, quality adjusted life years uh, as applied to the different conditions. So uh, it's, of course, not a perfect measure, uh, but still it does incorporate uh, some ethical input regarding comparison between how bad schizophrenia is compared to heart disease. So it's it's not perfect, but it's it's not not uh, uh, completely um, arbitrary. And also, I think that uh, even a choice between two embryos already results in reductions of up to 50% in major conditions. So that's already uh, important. I mean, of course, it's, it's nice if we had uh, the ability to generate the best possible embryo uh, using hundreds or thousands of, of embryos. But uh, even what we have right now, it's already a, a significant improvement. And I wholeheartedly agree uh, that uh, gene editing uh, is, is a great idea. And um, if I'm still around uh, at the time, I, I would want to be gene edit myself. Uh, but for now, I think that uh, PGTP uh, will be quite powerful. So just to Qualifying what you're saying, quality, this stands for quality adjusted life years. It's a metric of uh, lifespan that's used by the WHO, uh, by the National Healthcare Service of Great Britain, uh, by numerous public health agencies across the world. So, this is uh, how these different diseases are weighted and generating the embryo health score. Just to elaborate on what, what Paul is saying. And since you had questions about how that's generated, Julian, maybe I could just ask Nathan, could you just elaborate a little bit on, on how? That's done. If that's something you want to talk about. Yeah, I think uh, uh, Rafael covered some of the things I also wanted to bring up with, with Julian um, as well. Um, you know, the the data I presented relatively quickly is, in fact, just when you have two available and you do see significant reductions. It's not necessarily to the level of eradicating disease, obviously. Um, but statistically, there should be a significant improvement in health if it were to be used uh, more broadly. Um, again, even with only two to begin with. The other thing was pleiotropy, and, and, and it's sort of counterintuitive, I guess, but um, all of those diseases were reduced in parallel. Uh, 
So it wasn't like you were choosing a different embryo for each disease or different sibling for each disease. Choosing one of the two uh, gave you all of those reductions in parallel. Um, and I, I think Jen could probably, uh, I think Julian, you got my puppy really excited too. She's, she's running around. Um, but I think Jen could probably talk a little bit about how patients can use the information in multiple ways. They don't have to rely only on the embryo health score. And you know, for me, that would be important too. I have I have diabetes, so if, if I um, saw the embryo health score was better for an embryo that had a higher risk of, of type one diabetes, I might make a different decision. And we we do provide that information. I think it's an important part of the genetic counseling to set that up that way. Just before we myself. go to Jennifer, can I just ask you? So that's encouraging that that all of these diseases sort of go in in parallel together. Um, but but what about other uh, non-disease traits? So you know you had with this CCR5 uh, deletion that you know there was an association with with enhanced cognitive development. Um, I mean disease isn't the only thing that matters to us. Um, so do you do you have an idea about the impacts on on important non-disease traits? Because it, it might be that all your diseases are going down. But you're not going to do very well at school. Uh, so, what do you have any sense of of those sorts of relationships? Is that for me? Wow, whoever we, knows. Uh, yeah. <laughs> good, good question. I'm going to give that one to Laurent because he knows the best about the, that area. Sure. Um, it's not something we're looking at. Um, I mean, what you can say broadly, though, is that um, diseases, as Nathan was mentioning, pleiotropy so far, what we've seen is that there's um, a positive synergy. So negative things uh, tend to go together. Um, but apart from that, there's no uh, positively investigated relationship of the type that you're describing that we've done. But there's research from other groups that is interesting, I suppose. As it is, um, with the mental uh, illnesses, however, there are some fairly well established uh, links between uh, type 2 diabetes, for example, and some mental illnesses. So there's a correlation that seems to go across the board for many of the various illnesses um, that are possible. Thanks. And also, uh, we know that, for example, intelligence uh, is associated with uh, good health outcomes across the board. Uh, and uh, I don't know if the relationship also goes, well, it, the relationship also goes the other way, right? Uh, people with um, low uh, blood pressure with uh, excellent cardiovascular health actually have a better cognitive function as well, which may be simply because, uh, you know, the high blood pressure damages the brain directly. Um, so I, I would not expect that selecting for a good cardiovascular health would result in any uh, any limitations, any pleiotropic negative impact uh, on cognition. So I was just going to ask Jennifer a question then, since you're you're concerned about this hyperparenting objection. So the the film that is always wheeled out to me when I give these talks is Gadiga, and what people are terrified about is is and actually. Gadiga has, you know, embryos ranked for all of their diseases exactly as you're doing. Um, and, and, you know, one of the concerns is that people will be relegated to, to certain roles in society. So you can imagine seeing a whole range of conditions. You have an embryo with, a, with very good scores on, on everything, but actually has an increased risk of arrhythmias. And so the parents choose that embryo because it's got the highest overall score. But then they're really worried about arrhythmias. So they don't let the child, um, you know, do sports uh, and, and sort of mollycoddle the child. This is the concern. I, this is not my concern. But I'm wondering um, how realistic that you think that concern is and how you sort of overcome this problem also that, that the, the genetics community has, that the parents will have knowledge about the child's dispositions um, and, and that they will react adversely and they've invaded the child's privacy around the knowledge of their... So uh, these aren't my concerns, but I'm wondering how you address them. 
That's a really good question. Um, and I think that, that that's something we're very interested in learning more about. Um, we're, we're actually starting, uh, we have a, a study um, that's designed to look at how people use this information and what impact this information has over time. And we're hoping that in the next few years, we'll get some feedback from couples who have used this technology to see if this ultimately increases anxiety based on you know the results uh you know decreases or if this is information that essentially they use to make a decision with and kind of you know forget about once the pregnancy occurs and they kind of put out of their mind um i don't know um you know necessarily you know what the the overarching you know feeling may be but i definitely can imagine in the same way that monogenic testing is used now that there will be parents that will get information about certain risks that may stay with them and may inform their behavior you know over time and that that can be the case now if a couple has you know for example uh you know just you know, the other day we were getting in feedback from a couple who were planning on transferring an embryo that's positive for BRCA1 variant, um, a male embryo, because that's the embryo they have to use. And it's the decision to either have another cycle or not to have a child or to use that embryo. Certainly, I can imagine that they're going to be worried about potential cancer risks over the course of that individual's lifetime. But at the same time, that information can be used also as a method of preparation, and in some ways as a as a way of, of uh, guarding against some of those conditions because you can use that information to get better screening, to inform your clinical team, as opposed to it being just sort of an un unknown. I think polygenic testing falls into that category in that same way that the, these more mild monogenic variants can be used. So I think we're already sort of there, you know, in terms of how patients, you know, and, and looking at the model of monogenic testing to maybe see how that would be, you know, that maybe there would be some sort of similar use in the polygenic space. But we're very interested in that. And it's something that we hope to learn much more about, you know, as we get further in this process, for sure. Oh, you're mentioning it. I think. I'm worried about the, the the Embryo Health Study. I just put up a, a slide about it, or the uh, the flip book. Do you want to just say what it's about a bit more? Yeah, sure. So we're we're um, we're looking at we're offering polygenic testing uh, to couples who are already um, interested in undergoing PGTA testing. So these are families that are already going through the IVF process and already going through the PGT P PGTA process. And they have the opportunity to accept or decline PGTP testing. And they have the option of getting their aneuploidy screening results first and then making that decision or getting everything all together and getting the embryo health score right away. And the goal is really to understand how this information is used, how many patients are interested in this, how many patients would want this information, and if they accept this information, how does it actually inform their decision making? Are they using the embryo health score to make decisions about which embryo to prioritize for transfer? And hopefully we're able, we will be able to do more longitudinal you know, studies to actually look at patient experience and answer some of the questions you're asking about, you know, how does that inform behavior over time? You know, and are these risks staying with them? Does it increase or decrease anxiety? And how is it being used? Are they using this information to inform their clinic, their child's pediatrician, for example, things like that? So one one thing that uh, we should probably remember is that uh, full sequencing costs now about $200 from Nebula. My genome has been sequenced 30X and also the 100X sequencing and uh, Aurea's genome will be sequenced as well. So now parents have access to full information uh, about uh, genomes of their children and their own genomes uh, that is actually much more complete than the information obtained uh, through PGTP. Uh, so I don't think that uh, PGTP will uh, result in any anxiety because uh, we can uh, get uh, the information about uh, genomes um later after the baby is born and it's uh, much more complete and it's just last week that i got uh, a report telling me that uh, my risk of lewy body dementia is pretty low 14th percentile 
uh, and that I'm very likely to have dark eyes. And it's all true, right? My eyes are pretty brown. Um, could I just say that I, 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 um, I, 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 I find it difficult at times, and whether it's uh, philosophically, whether it's, it's it's a contradiction or, or hypocrisy, that that somehow reproductive roulette seems to be perceived generally that it's I mean yeah, I mean, but by all all aspects in society that I mean it's somehow um, normal or natural or, or, or in a God-given providence. And yet, when we come to uh, the healthcare roulette, as it were, the, um, any human healthcare initiative minimizing the chances of disease or, or the expression of disease is a universal goal. And there seems to be some contradiction there to me that, because um, we, we and it's great that Jennifer particularly is describing the, the, the data you're going to get because it's so important. It's not just about principles and opinions. It will be data driven. For example, I remember when we first did our single uh, cases with single women or, 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 or lesbian couples and male, male um, parents. The, the, the outlaw at the time with the damage that will be done is huge. And then you start seeing the data from Susan Belombo um, family center in Cambridge being the data being published that you know, is informing us that things are actually not as not as bad as people people believe but it, it seems to me that once a child is born and even if you have data that you have to then deal with about that child we, we get on and deal with it as best way we can you, your and the counseling around PGTP will be of course all about patient expectations and, and, and dealing with the potential issues um, as well, but somehow this reproductive uh, roulette issue is so much more difficult to handle than um, anything else in other, any other aspect of healthcare. I mean, uh, you know, well, what, and Julian, you probably have views on that too. As yeah, to why look, I, I, I mean, I, I agree with you. There's no, you know, good ethical justification, but I'll, I'll outline the argument that I think people have. So, opponents of this kind of technology and people who are opposed to interfering in the normal reproductive roulette think that children should be a gift, that we should accept them as they are, and provided they're normal. If they have serious diseases, you know, that's a reason to select against serious diseases. But within, within the range of normality, we should accept children as a gift. Um, and, and people will see that this is encroaching on normality. We all have risks of diabetes or Alzheimer's disease or something. We've all got risks of something. And so I think opponents of this technology will say, now you've moved in to not accepting children as gifts within the normal range. These were all normal embryos. Um, and and that that's wrong. Now, I think they make a deep mistake between accepting your child when it's born and then you do have to accept the child and if they're run over by a car and require lifelong care you need to look after the child you should accept that child uh, and choosing between embryos especially here when you have 20 embryos and you have to choose one so why just let why just throw a dice or allow nature when you could actually use information now you know i think the information at this point probably not that reliable, probably not that highly predictive, but it's better than nothing. Um, so why choose nothing when you have something of some value? It, it makes no rational sense to me, but I think it's it's caught up in this, this idea of, of accepting children and conflating embryos with children, um, and embryos are not children. So, so could I just take it one point further, and that is um, in terms of the ethical narrative, and again, this is where I have a problem with ethics and an everlasting principle as opposed to opinions and whose ethics. I come from the UK and we have a, a, a long trail of patients who were unable to get the technologies they required before they got too old and could never get them because it was deemed by the regulator to be an unethical technology. And yet over time that unethical technology became ethical, became acceptable. And there's a long list of those. And so 
I would like to understand in terms of potentially human rights and the freedom to choose, and especially when we're considering conditions of health. It's, it's this right to be able to choose as opposed to being told that something today is unethical, might not be unethical in 10, 10 years time. To me, that's not ethics, that's uh, opinions. Well, I mean, the problem with ethics is everyone's an ethical expert and everyone deals with ethics every day. You know, you have to make decisions about right and wrong. So in, in essence, you know, everyone's involved. And when it comes to, you know, these ethics committees or uh, they are really representing public sentiment. So the HFEA, you know, will conduct uh, a, a, an inquiry into whether to legalise sex selection. And they'll get a whole bunch of philosophical arguments that support people's freedom to choose the sex of a second or third embryo for family balancing. And they'll say, these are very sound arguments. And then they'll do a poll of, of the average person. And, you know, the majority will be opposed to sex selection. So they say, well, we'll continue to ban sex selection. That's the level of the ethics. It's really a kind of expression of public sentiment. Mary Warnock's, you know, whole 14 day rule was just a political compromise. There are no good philosophical reasons to think that the beginning of the neural streak or you know, the absence of twinning has any moral significance, yet it was just plucked out as something that people could rally around. So, and then you get these clinics that say it's unethical to select a healthier embryo. Well, what's the argument for that? So there's two kinds of ethics. There's sort of people like me who spend 20 years actually doing it every day. And then there's popular ethics, and, and unfortunately, that's not much better than just what, you know, the man in the street thinks or the woman in the street. I, I agree. And that's been my concern for the last 40 years. In fact, uh, now, Look, I've been nagging on about, you know, trying to get you access to more technologies for 20 years as well. And, it, you know, really, I mean, the well, sort of limitations that you face are completely crazy that, that, you know, you should be able to use, you know, PGD for anything, <laughs> any condition. Yeah, well, even, that even means our only option. Our only option is judicial review. So you, 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 you need, the, you need the, uh, the clout to be able to take a judicial review. And in one, in one way that you know, the US is, is, is you know, you're, you, this is being rolled out in the end, China will be rolling out, I can tell you right now, and, and Europe will be there mulling over the moral status of the embryo and the, the offence to human dignity of, of these sorts of technologies while, you know, the whole mo world moves on. So, Raphael, you're a that's trial point. That's, that's when it will be ethical. <laughs> what were we saying? No, I think you are a trailblazer. I think this is, uh, you know, going to be a technology of the future. I hope so. I really hope so. Can I ask you then, just since we're still going, um, did, did Aurea actually have any increased risks of conditions? Um, so she's got low risk of, of you know, she's got a high health score and, and a kind of low risk of cardiovascular conditions, but did, did she have sort of high risks of other conditions and, and you know, how will that influence uh, sure. you and your parenting? Uh, how do you feel about those? Because there must be some areas where, where she didn't so, as well. So uh, if, you, if you let me, uh share my screen again sure there you are okay so let me just show you that slide again so this is this is aria and as you can see her all the risk percentiles are below 50. so she is overall less likely to be uh to be sick than the average person and there are no concerns luckily um, so no, there is no worry, and um, I will be getting her sequenced, um, as I mentioned before. So if there is anything else that shows up, uh, that may be addressed. Uh, but um, should be no problems, I think. So yeah, uh, since I'm talking, uh, I think one one important ethical principle that that is applicable here is that uh, we should try and use the veil of ignorance from the child's point of view 
right? Because uh, imagine if you have a choice of being born into a body that is healthy versus a body that's not healthy. And that's mm -hmm. that's where the veil of ignorance uh, gives us the answer. Most normal people will want to be born into a healthy body. And that's uh, that's an argument that uh, if repeated often enough, uh, I think it will have an impact on the public. Uh, so I'm optimistic that these technologies will be spreading. Well, well I just, I don't want to inject philosophy into this uh, webinar uh, late at night, but this is sort of one point where I disagree with you um, because, uh, you know, if, if, if by chance you'd made a mistake and transferred that second embryo in, instead of Aurea with the higher risks, um, uh, you wouldn't have harmed that embryo. You, it's not as if you could have given that individual a better body because that individual's only chance of existence was with those health risks. So this is called the non-identity problem uh, of reproduction that you don't you don't harm or benefit embryos through selection you bring into the world different children who will have healthier lives um, but curiously it's not a benefit or a harm to them so that's one of the objections to using this kind of technology that it, it, it's not actually providing any person affecting benefits it's making the world a better place. And, and, and as you said, it's reducing the incidence of disease and the cost of disease, but it's not actually um, benefiting or harming individuals because they don't have a chance of a different body. They only have one chance of existence. But yeah, I, I see it actually differently, right? Because uh, I don't see the individual as the genes. I mean, the genes are the machines that we use to run our bodies. Uh, the individual is uh, is a and part of social construct. We we become who we are by interacting with our parents, uh, by growing, by learning, by creating our own personal identity out of personal memories. Well, and uh, the body we live in, it's it's just a machine that supports us. Well, I, I I think that's an interesting perspective. And again, we have a reasonable disagreement because. In my view, you know, we are our minds and our minds, you know, are, are situated in our brains and our brains will be, are a part of our body and, you know, roughly half of that will be genetic. So uh, we aren't just mysterious spirits, I think you were talking about. Well, no, no, no. The spirit I'm, is the mind which resides in the brain, which is partly determined by the genes. Yeah, I mean, so, I'm nothing of the kind i'm i'm a pure materialist so I'm, I'm not saying that there is some sort of mysterious spirit but the thing is that the personal identity is uh is created over over a period of time right it's not something that is simply determined by a set of genes that you happen to have uh it's it's something that is created in a process right we but become but I, human. Agree, I agree with that but if you have different genes you would have a different person that's so you might have a male, you know, instead of well, a female. So, but but I see it this way, uh, you know, if if I lost a hand, I would be still myself. Uh, if somebody changed my genes to reduce my risk of uh, heart attack, I would be still myself because I would still have the same. There would be still the same parents. I would be still. Uh, the 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 man who grew up in Poland and then came to the United States, etc. Cetera, et cetera. My personal history would be uh, the same general idea, right? Um, well, I agree with so that. Yes, but if they changed the genes for your brain, you would be a different person if they changed it at the stage of an embryo. Depends so how much, right? If, yeah, that's if the, if, if the oh, change this, is profound. This has, up, uh, this has come up with me several times as well. I, I uh, <laughs> I mentioned I have diabetes, and and so I sometimes I say, well, if my parents had our test and did IVF, I I probably wouldn't be here. They might have picked an embryo with a lower risk of diabetes. And then you can go on and say, well, if they had gene editing, they could have cured my diabetes. And then uh, several times people ask, well, do you think you would have ended up being the person you are? Um, you know, your interest in genetics and uh, diabetes, stem cells, all those things would have changed um, 
if you, you know, didn't develop diabetes. So I'm not sure it's an easy question to answer. Well, well if, if you were an identical twin, uh, I, presumably you would still develop diabetes, but you may not have the same opinion. The thing is that yeah, I, mean, I, if, I might I might actually be different in terms of how I function in society if I didn't have diabetes. And, and, yeah. Sure. I don't like sure. having the conversation because it makes but, it seem like I'm a really twin important be, person. Will, but. <laughs> but your identical twin will have the same genes uh, and the same genes driving your that, that body, but the views may be totally different, uh, and therefore the personality may be totally different. Um, I, I, and so I'm not quite sure whether, who I'm supporting, whether it's different <laughs> positions, but, but it seems to be the identical twin argument is a pretty powerful argument about, about uh, the differential between, between genes, pure genes, and, 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 and individuals. Well, these are deep questions, so uh, it's, <laughs> I'm sure, I'm sure we'll we'll continue to disagree or discuss them for for decades. Uh, but, but, but the, the important thing is that it's it's the genes. Difference. Yeah, but the important thing is that genes affect our health. Okay, and what we're talking about here is being able, where we can, in a situation of embryo selection, do we just want to do it on the basis of some cells are more fragmented than the other, or actually on the basis of uh, the embryos to give us the best chance of a healthy life birth and a healthy life thereafter. I totally agree, but but if we are selecting embryos that don't have type 1 diabetes, we won't be selecting Nathan. Um, uh, he's, he's, he's never going to benefit from that technology. Now, there'll be somebody else who might be nicer and more intelligent or, you know, a better scientist than Nathan, but, but he won't, he, he would not have existed. So, their argument is, well, you know, it's not benefiting anyone. Why should we do it? And and I, I still think there is a benefit to having people who have better chances of better. And the, and when we when we say you should reduce carbon emissions or reduce pollution for the sake of future generations, the actions that you take will change the timing of reproduction, which will create different future generations. But we still think that we should make their well-being higher, even though they're different people than would have been if we continued to produce carbon emissions. So that's again, you know, support this idea. Zika and with PTM, with screen against Down syndrome, exactly the same arguments that yeah. have been made for 40 years. Yeah. But I would just differ, but and I, I respect your argument, Raphael, and I think it's a very sophisticated one, but I would differ and say, you're not making somebody, an individual better, you're bringing a better individual into existence, but you know, Rafa will disagree with that. And and so and most people actually have your view, Rafa, to, to say. I mean, having given these talks a lot, people have your intuition that that actually you're affecting the chances of individuals. So yeah, um, the question of personal identity is actually a very very complicated issue, and. Uh, I have, I've been for a long time a part of a mailing list where the question of personal identity has been cropping up over and over again over the past 25 years. So yeah, it's, it's a complicated issue and I don't think we'll be able to uh, give it justice uh, in this discussion. Truth be told, I think that though this is extremely interesting, um, we had slated less time for this discussion than we perhaps have taken already. And uh, I think that this has been a tremendous success. Um, I, I'm, I'm very impressed with you all. Um, and I think that this calls for a redo sometime in the future. Very Thanks good. very much. Good night. Okay. Thank you. Off to bed. Thank you. Nice to meet you. Thanks very much. Good night. Stay Thank well. You. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. Thank you.